went on and we would appreciate it. Thank you very much. So I think, are we ready to go? The talk is good. Uh, the class is out in the hall. You're, you're stiff, right? <laughs> this is not the girls' across team. <laughs> so, uh, can we see if the uh, wax play is there? I'm having trouble with it. You keep getting your untrusted server. I said it was okay. They're coming in right now. All right. I really didn't realize how much I missed you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, you know what I was psyched about? I don't have to do the roll call now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right. So my computer here. I missed that one. Why do I have 75 seconds? All right, I would like to call tonight's meeting to order. This is the September 9th meeting of the Westwood School Committee. Um, and we are going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to recognize Westwood Media Center, which is live streaming the meeting and also recording this for later viewing on its platform. I also want to note that there is um, the ability to publicly participate via Zoom tonight. The instructions are on our website. Um, if you do want to call, if you're watching and you do want to call into Zoom, um, you have to be on the Zoom to call in. And just click on the link on the website and it'll get you there. Uh, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Emily for the superintendent's report. Great, thanks. It's nice to be back here I know. in person. We haven't been know. in this room in, in quite a while, so uh, thanks. And um, we are starting tonight. I'm getting some echo. Is that feedback. okay? I see Melinda's on that. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Well, I will forge ahead. Um, all right, so I am happy tonight to start um, by welcoming the members of our girls lacrosse team who were the Division I state champions. I believe your championship game was on July 1st. Is that correct? All right. And um, so we, want, we know that you have been feted and celebrated in many places. You've been to Fenway Park, we hear. <laughs> this probably is not quite as exciting as Fenway, <laughs> but we felt like we wanted to bring you in um, just to say we know you are part of this proud, storied history of girls lacrosse in Westwood and we are very very proud of you and so we want to have the opportunity to congratulate you as well. So um, if you didn't have the opportunity to see the game, the Westwood Select Board did a proclamation for the team. They actually have declared Tuesday, July 13th, 2021 as Westwood Girls Lacrosse Day in Westwood, Massachusetts. <laughs> and so I got my hands on a copy of the proclamation. What I noticed is that the proclamation pretty much is like being there, if you read what it says. So I thought I would just read it to the crowd. All right, so it says, whereas the select board officially recognizes the Westwood High School girls lacrosse team for its state final win against Franklin High School on Thursday, July 1st, 2021, and whereas the Westwood girls lacrosse team ended the season undefeated with 24 wins, bringing the trophy back to Westwood, whereas on a rain-soaked field, the girls lacrosse team started the game strong with goals by Lindsay Di Diamati, is that correct? Yes, Diomedi, Diomedi, right? Uh, Diomedi and Ava Connaughton to start the game 2-0 and force an early timeout by the Franklin Panthers. 
Whereas Ashley Mackin's sidearm snipe on net made the score 4 0 with 7.39 left in the second quarter, but Franklin responded to hold the Wolverines to only one goal over the next 30 minutes and tied the game at 5 5. Whereas the Wolverines' goaltender, Anya Holland, led the defensive unit to a strong performance, making some stellar stops down the stretch. Whereas after forcing a turnover with two minutes left, the Wolverines ran the clock down to take a final shot, but physical play caused a scrum to ensue and a change in possession, resulting in the Wolverines needing to force another turnover. Whereas, with the ball back with the Wolverines and with 12 seconds left to play in regulation, Ava Connaughton's around the net, shovel style goal secured the win for Westwood. Whereas the entire team contributed to the 6 5 win over the Franklin High School Panthers supported by Margaret Spatola and the outstanding coaching staff. Therefore, let it be proclaimed that Tuesday, July 13, 2021, shall be known as Westwood Girls Lacrosse Day in Western Massachusetts to honor the 2021 Girls Lacrosse team on its state championship win. That is pretty much play by play. It sounds like an <laughs> exciting game. So well done. So we don't have a fancy proclamation for you, but we do have a Yes, I think Charlie though wants to oh, say Charlie, something. Oh, Charlie, great. Before. Yes, you have a connection. Yes. Uh, I would just like to say I attended most of your games, and you did a tremendous job. Uh, what a lot of people don't appreciate is that we have a dynasty here, like we once had in basketball, that in the last 18 years, Westwood High has won the state championship Division I nine times. Uh, the top six teams in Massachusetts at the end of the year all were undefeated except for one loss to Westwood. It's a tremendous record. And I am biased because my, uh, my uh, dear uh, Lil Hancock uh, was on the team with you. So I wanted to thank all of you for the tremendous uh, showing you did, uh, the great respect that many towns have for Westwood because of all of your work. So thank you all very much. other things to do tonight, so.
Okay. Thanks, Margo. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so next, I just want to introduce some new administrators. And I know you've seen folks on Zoom, but here they are in person. So um, first, I just want to acknowledge Matt Kuklins, who is not new, but he is in a new role this year as the interim principal of the Hanlon School. And um, then we've, we've made a bunch of switches. So I don't see Nicole Haberman here tonight, but I just want to acknowledge that Nicole um, has been wonderful and flexible, and she has gone to Thurston this year as the assistant principal at Thurston while Matt is at Hanlon. Um, we are welcoming to the district Tom Millett. Hello, Tom. And uh, so Tom is uh, at the high school this year as the assistant principal there. And then serving as our interim dean of students is Ashleen Flanagan, who you know from the English department and also formally doing an interim gig as the dean of students. And she has graciously agreed to serve in that role again this year. So thank you to all of you. Uh, continuing with the introductions, I want to introduce you to Ruby Fife. And Ruby is our student representative to the school committee this year. Uh, Ruby is a senior at the high school here. She is the, I'm told, the Secretary General of the Westwood High School Model UN. Very fancy. Yes. Uh, she's a representative for Massachusetts Girls State, member of the varsity swim team. Uh, outside of school, she works for the Registrar at Town Hall, supporting local elections. And she interned with Senator Mike Rush authoring legislation for the Massachusetts House of Representatives. So certainly has a lot of experience in um, local governance and we welcome you, Ruby, and we really look forward to you um, being part of the conversation here. Thank so, you. Thanks. Um, okay. Let's see, so moving on to school reopening. Um, so first I just wanna give a, a quick hiring update. As I mentioned in our last meeting, we had quite a bit of turnover this summer. And um, so it was a very busy hiring season. Since we last spoke, we have had some last minute resignations of instructional assistants and other paraprofessionals. So we are continuing with the hiring process now. Um, we are also still looking for substitute teachers and for employees for our extended day program. Um, we did end up contracting for nursing services for extended day because we were unable to find a suitable candidate um, and we really needed to have that program up and running at the beginning of the year. So that is our, our strategy at least to start. Um, and I do wanna thank Michael Fagoni for all of his efforts to rebuild extended day after last year's hiatus. So the program is, it's up and going. The numbers for extended day. Well, I will say Michael's doing a great job. My, kid, my son is in extended day, and it's been great. Everyone's that's great. happy to be back there, and it's it's been a lot of fun. Oh, good. That's yeah. good to hear. Okay, great. Um, I did want to mention to the committee some things in the area of policy. So, we have um, we've gotten some feedback from parents who are concerned about our notification to parents about curriculum, materials, or activities that involve um, sex education. And um, in fact, this year we've received a few requests from people to review curricular materials and to opt students out of lessons that pertain to sex education or family life. Um, and so I, I just wanted to bring that to your attention, that that's some feedback we've gotten. Um, you know, as an, you know, as a district, we're really committed to the value of respecting human difference and making sure that our schools are a safe and welcoming place for all of our kids. Um, I would say we are also committed to following our own policies, acting with transparency and working to understand people's 
concerns. And you know, I think some of the feedback we've gotten are concerns that maybe we didn't communicate very well about some things. Um, so we've been thinking about this, and I, I think in some of the cases, we haven't communicated that well in part because we may have sort of differing understandings of what some of our policies mean or, um, or because we're working to align our practice with state regulations that have come into place since the policies were put in place. Um, so I, I wanted to bring that to your attention because I think, I think it would be very helpful for principals who ultimately have to operationalize and implement policy if the school committee took some time to review some of these policies that haven't been reviewed in a while. Um, and, you know, so my suggestion is it may be time to form a subcommittee and make sure that we, you know, have policies that have clear language, that isn't vague, um, make sure that our policies reflect current laws and regulations and, and make sure they don't conflict with each other, which sometimes they do, there are overlaps. Um, so that, I'm bringing that to your attention and my suggestion would be that if this sounds like a good idea that maybe at the October meeting I could put together a list and say like, here's sort of a bundle of them that I think maybe are related to each other that we should take a look at. And um, if we kind of agree on the list, then in November we could get a subcommittee going. Yeah, I Does think that that's seem? a great idea. We had, years ago, we had some other policies that we updated and went through the same process. <coughs> Well, you know, you can never do, you can never review the whole manual at once, right? So things have to kind of be updated periodically. And we've done some things as different laws and regs have come into and effect. But change. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. I think also the communication piece is important, as you mentioned. Yeah. So we're all on the same page. Parents are on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, and we can certainly take a look at that yeah. um, at the same time. Yeah. But I think it'd be I great. agree a subcommittee makes sense to me. So I guess the question is, is yeah. this, I'm maybe I'm not on, mm -hmm. is this a full review? Because the, 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 is this a specific, I guess there's other specific policies you want to review. Yes. I know you talked about kind of sex ed, but right. are there other ones that say, aside from that, you think we should be reviewed as part of this? Well, I was suggesting that we, I mean, probably there are lots of policies yeah. that we could be reviewing, but in this context, I was really thinking about some of the things that have to do with like sex education, um, parental notification, Got opting okay. out. Um, there are, there's a policy about um, teaching about diversity, you know, I mean, things okay. that I think may, there may be some intersection. I Got thought it. we should okay. look at those. Got it. Does thank that you. make sense? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Okay. I, I also would like to say, as all of us, we're getting a lot of telephone calls, as you have, from yeah. people. Uh, they get, it's a great thought to do this sort of thing. And yeah. uh, uh, I think it would be valuable going into it if you could share with us the comments that are coming in. You know, yeah, sure. That would be very valid look at what the other concerns people have. And back, uh, I think it was probably about six months ago when uh, we had somebody come on as a public speaker saying that uh, our, uh, uh, I guess, uh, courses are more Marxist philosophy or something mm. uh, about how we treat history. Mm. So what I, I'd like to put in, in with the, the, the sexual and all of that, mm -hmm. the issue of how, how are we trying to become more open to history mm -hmm. and what are we doing that's different and what are other people doing that's mm -hmm. different in the teaching of history. That's, I, I'd, I'd put that in with the same thing as far as policies and how are we trying to do it and what have we changed and what's new uh, because I've got comments on both of those issues and I think it would be valuable to re-examine them and look at them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and I think we're finishing up uh, social studies review so it's a good time for that. Um, yeah, I mean, we're coming off of obviously a very disrupted year last year with COVID and it, I think it's great to get back to sort of some of these bigger picture things and kind of getting back on track. So, absolutely. Um, okay, so I will plan to come back in October with sort of a list to take a look at. Great, great. okay. Um, so just a few COVID updates. Actually, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, I think I'm gonna share my screen. Says that I am disabled for sharing. No, I think, Is um, that Steve who can? <coughs> okay, thank you. Oh, great, thank you. Yeah. All right. So, let me just. Okay. Um, so, I want to. Hmm. I was going to present. I do not see how to do that. Well, I'm going to leave it. So this is a photo that I, uh, oh, there we go. That is of the, um, 
mobile vaccine clinic that we had last Friday. It was a beautiful sunny day for a clinic. Um, and so I really want to thank uh, Amanda Fairbanks and also Karen Parida and some of our nursing staff who made this happen. We partnered with um, a vendor from um, through DPH called JRI to do this vaccine clinic. And we um, had 17 students and three adults attend the clinic. JRI actually told us that it's the second largest clinic that they've had, oh. so that was good. Um, and I just want to make people aware that we're continuing to do this. So our next clinic is on Saturday, September 25th. It's at Sheehan from 9 to 12. Is that Westwood Day? It is Westwood Day, which is why we've moved it to Sheehan. And so this would be, um, it's the second dose for the people who came uh, last Friday or it could also be a first dose if there are new people who want to come. And so when you arrive at the vaccine clinic, you have the option of either getting Pfizer, which of course is the one that's approved for our school age kids, or you can get the one shot J and J. So if you're an adult, you can choose. Um, everyone is welcome. It's not just for students, it's for anybody at all. And then we will have a third date on Saturday, October 16th. That will be back at the middle school from nine to 12. So that is our plan. Um, and then, oops, I just wanted to share a couple more things about COVID. So I just shared these graphs with you. You've seen them before, just to sort of, oh, didn't change there. That's funny. Oh, there we go, just a delay. Um, so you can see sort of where we are here. There hasn't been a whole lot of change um, since the, Meeting in August, percent positivity has ticked up a little bit, but basically we're kind of holding steady where we've been the last couple of weeks in Westwood. Um, there is good news on community vaccination rates. So as of today, um, we actually have seen a little bit of movement in here. And they were quite high last time we looked at it, but in this 12 to 15 age group for Westwood, we've seen a little uptick. So this is fully vaccinated 82%, that was 76% yeah. the last time we looked at it. And at least one dose is now 93% for Westwood. So that's really great. Um, I also wanna mention what's happening with the testing program. We've gotten a lot of questions about this and we did send a letter out to families today. Um, so they should have received that. Uh, as I mentioned, the state has, transition to a new testing coordinator, CIC, and it has not been a perfectly smooth transition. There have been some glitches in that. Um, but our test program coordinator, Amanda Fairbanks and Abby have been working diligently to get it up and running. So we were given the registration link yesterday. The letter went out to families today to register students for the testing program. Um, the registration process is both for um, routine COVID safety testing formerly referred to as pool testing. So the state's kind of renamed that. Um, and it's also for the new test and stay program, which is that program so that um, unvaccinated close contacts are able to stay in school and not have to quarantine. So we certainly encourage people to read the information about the program, reach out to our COVID team if they have any questions and hopefully sign your student up. Um, I have a I, quick question about sure. that, Emily. Um, it's something that um, people have asked me before, and yeah. I just want to clarify. It seems clear now that you can't pick one or the other, that you're signing up for the program, so you're going to be enrolled in both types of testing, correct? Well, so the the way that CIC set up the portal is it's one consent. I, yeah, and I went so, through it. Right, that's and, and that's like, so that's how it's set up at yep. the state. and. Um, it does have some language about like your school will tell you which of these are available. So we are making available the pool testing and the test and stay. And we frankly think that just operationally, it'd be really great if we could bundle those together, people could consent to both and we could just go. Um, for the pool testing at the elementary level, if you um, have opted to have your kid participate, then when it comes time to test, we go find them. To be honest, at the middle school and high school level, the student basically has to come down, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't go chase them down. So I do think parents could have some conversations mm -hmm. about what it is that they wanna do. Mm -hmm. But right now you're, you're opting into okay. the whole thing. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I also want to clarify our uh, question, Charlie. I, Sorry. I, I didn't want to interfere. No. Uh, these shots, are one, could we get copies of them? Just sure. so we can do it more carefully. Yeah. Uh, last time we did, uh, we asked parents for permission to do testing, mm -hmm. and not everybody gave approval. Right. Do you know what the last time we did it? Were the percentages? What the percentage was? And mm. by, and they, I don't know, 60 something percent, to, like, maybe? Yeah, I don't know. 62. It'd be helpful yeah. to know how. Yeah. What percent yeah. for the younger kids who aren't having, you know, uh, any kind of uh, vaccines? It's very vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'd like to, if we could, how do we compare with other towns yeah. as far as parents cooperating? And and what maybe more education is needed to tell parents how important this is mm -hmm. for their kids not to come in and be tested with everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd like to kind of find out how do we compare because I don't think we were at the cutting edge last time. Remember, number seventy percent were giving permission. Yeah. Uh, and it's worse now than it was last year. It's more dangerous. And so what, what kind of response do you get? What kind of public education can we get with people in the town speaking out, and educating people? Mm -hmm. There will be resistance no matter what. And how well do we do compared to other towns? Are we yeah. behind everybody or whatever? Uh, just so we can make sure more and more begin to get tested at the different levels. Yeah, I can certainly reach out to other superintendents and see if I can find that information and um, as I said CSE has been kind of like building this as they go and so we wish that we had had time to do a yeah. webinar and all that but we are erring on the side of just getting the registration link out at this point point. and I, I would just say uh, as people call in or email with questions what we're saying is just enroll and we'll continue to refine the communication and, and do public education as we go but the most important thing is to get people, you know, to, to want to enroll. So I think um, in the next weeks we'll send out more updates and people can make decisions with older kids based on, on what's right for and their family. It clear, we're trying to protect your kids. You know, yep. your kids are in here. This stuff is floating around. It's a go around on, on the country. And if, if you don't participate, you're not helping us protect all of the kids. Mm -hmm. and, and also to thank Karen and Amanda for, and you, Abby, for all the work you're doing behind the scenes to keep this thing going. Uh, thank you for... Yep. The, uh, the, uh, all the all the efforts you put into this. Yeah, and if people are looking for the link, it's on our website, right? On the yep. school committee COVID site? It is on the... Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, it's on the website and in their inbox. Yes. And in your inbox, and just in, your in your case right. you get a million emails. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> Correct. <laughs> okay. Um, I've gotten a couple of questions about uh, lunch. <laughs> and so I want to update you. At our last meeting in August, I said we're still refining the lunch plans. Um, and the plans for lunch differ by level, although I will say at all levels, the default plan is to have students eat outdoors whenever possible. So on sunny days, that's been great. Um, so really, we're talking about our inclement weather plan. So at the middle school, they, of course, have their fantastic tent. And we now have um, enough tables that will accommodate an entire grade in the tent. And so that's just where they have lunch. I will say, I had a car of middle school <coughs> kids today, and they were very appreciative of the tables All right. in the tent. They well, thought that was a great addition to lunch. I'm <laughs> thrilled to hear that. That's great. <laughs> yes. Everyone likes a table. Yes. Um, so at the elementary levels, uh, you know, where all of our students are unvaccinated, when it isn't possible to eat outdoors, each school has some plan to space students out using both the cafeteria and some additional space, such as the gym. Um, so the general principle is the same across schools, but the actual plan differs depending on, you know, the size of the space and how many kids are in the class and all of that. But that's generally um, what we are doing. At the high school where our vac vaccination rates are the highest and where students sort of have the greatest degree of autonomy at lunch, right, they're kind of free at lunch, um, I would say the, the plan there is more fluid. So some students, of course, have privileges and they can leave school for lunch. Um, and the remaining students can space out as much as possible in the cafeteria or at the high top tables out in the, um, the art gallery area and other areas of the building. And some students do still prefer to eat outdoors. I mean, I actually, it was raining today and I looked out my window and I saw some kids who were eating outside. So we certainly allow them to do that if that is their preference. Um, so as far yep. as tents go, so we have the two, right? Is there any opportunity no. more or is there still a shortage is the expense still so high what do you yeah think? it's not the expense it's it's the, the supply shortage. chain yeah it's it's that's what it is so we have a tent at middle school downey and sheehan right. and you know we put it out to bid and um 
we've really been beating the bushes. We yeah. even looked into if we somehow, you know, people were saying, can you buy a tent on Amazon or Wayfair? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the issue there is, you know, for us, we have to have it, for, well, it has, yes, it has to be a high quality tent for safety. It has to be professionally installed. It has to pass muster with our insurance right. company. Um, so it's not, you know, as straightforward as setting it up in your backyard. Um, yeah. So I've been communicating with the companies that we originally reached out to to get quotes and to see if they have any capacity and we're you know they're they're monitoring one of them said that they had us in mind and they were you know we're on their list so as soon as they get any room in their schedule they'll be reaching out to us to let us know so how did it happen that a few of the schools ended up with tents and some didn't was it the individual like principals or people within the school no 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 so we or? so we were able to we had the middle school tent and we kind of had squatters rights on it because we didn't give it back over the summer right and then we were able to secure two other tents i think from two different companies is that right or um, is it one same company? company one same company and really what it was is we looked at um the class sizes and numbers and space and decided that downey and sheen were the two places that we were going to prioritize them so um, they were just the uh, lucky. And all of this is more than Desi's. I just, I just want to reiterate, yeah. Desi's guidance was basically, they didn't guide on lunch. They, they were, were silent. Yeah. yeah. So we're doing more, uh, given some of the feedback from our advisory group, we're doing more than, you know, the Desi guidance. You know, even, you know, even now, without some of those kind of stuff. Well, yeah. there was no guidance. Yeah, so well, there yeah. was no guidance. So we're doing more, yes. Well, there was no guidance. And honestly, I think that probably there was no guidance because they know for some schools, strict rules around lunch would be impossible it would be impossible it would be a barrier to having kids in person and so you know they just didn't say anything so we're you know we're trying to be prudent particularly where question. kids are unvaccinated yeah well, last year when we were getting into this one of the big issues was ventilation and yeah we have a lot of old buildings with window problems and all the rest and there's supposedly money now available in the air of ventilation yeah and, have we been able to do anything in yeah. improving ventilation I mean, or getting money to do it? So we did everything that we could do last year to improve our our ventilation system. We did everything we could. Um, and so I mean, we had a thorough just inspection and maintenance project across multiple buildings, but including this one, which really was overdue. So that was one effort last summer that was um, very comprehensive and we were able to secure it partly because we had scheduled some of that work in advance before other districts were clamoring for it. Um, but we added filtering in many more um, locations, the, the MRF 13 filters that were the recommended density of filter at that time. And we continue to replace those filters on a quarterly basis. Um, we've also been focusing on cleaning ducts. So I can update you more on that in a future meeting, but we did some duct cleaning work this summer. So that wasn't a good, so good shape relative to ventilation. Yeah. We continue to do the work, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's filtration, and then we've also maximized um, any way that we mechanically can draw in fresh air, we've maximized that mm -hmm. through our, our system. So I think we've done, yeah, we've done what we can do there. Um, okay, so that's it on COVID, unless there's anything else on that question. We have had a few cases, so I think we have four or five people out now yep. in quarantine. Um, do you have, you have, you have that chart? Do you have the current chart of what students are not? I'm going to move on. Oh. That's next. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so I think I have to go back for that. Um, there we go. So enrollment update. Um, we had quite a bit of movement over the summer, both with, I mean, sort of in and out, but net, we had more people move in <laughs> than we had move out. Um, and so you can see here, this is what we were projecting back at budget time. And so, um, you know, our, our, we are net up, right? We've had a small increase overall in the district, but not terribly significant. But I think what is notable is that um, that increase has to do with this um, more significant increase here at the elementary level. And I left the asterisks on from the budget presentation because we said at the time, well, this is probably a little low because the incoming kindergarten numbers likely are going to go up a little bit. People tend to move to town when their kids are starting kindergarten. We knew that. Um, but I will say we had more kindergarten move-ins this year than usual. So we actually ended up with 19 more kindergartners than we projected. Wow. Um, 
which is quite a bit. And so as you know, um, over the summer, we did add an additional position at elementary at the Downey. We created that K-1, and that really was to accommodate the higher um, kindergarten numbers than we expected. The good news is, is that though, um, you know, overall there's what, 45 more elementary kids than we had projected, our elementary class sizes really were very low and we, we you know, knew that we would be able to accommodate increases. And so, um, you know, the good news is, is that the numbers really held. Um, and so, if I can show you this, this is the chart you're talking about? Yeah. I think, yeah. Okay, let me see if I can make it bigger for you. No, that's chart. Um, mm -hmm. This chart's going to go through years it's in perpetuity. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So, I mean, our I have to say our class size chart, uh, I mean, it's kind of never looked better, uh, mm -hmm. to, to be honest. Um, we have 37 of our sections that are actually below the school committee class size guideline. And, you know, we did that intentionally and strategically this year, given the disruption of last year. We have another 28 that are within guideline, and we have three sections that are one above. Um, so that really is, is quite good. And I would just point out that the thing that we really talked about in budget season is we wanted to keep grade five small. Remember we said we thought that, you know, of all of the elementary grades this year, that was the grade that kind of had the least, or the most disruption last year in terms of when we were able to bring people back. And so we really committed to keeping those numbers low, and you can see, what the fifth grade numbers are there. They're really quite good. Mm -hmm. So I think we're in good shape. One Thanks. question. Any explanation for the middle school and high school projections versus what happened? Because that's a decent number of kids like in high school can miss on a projection. I yeah, don't I don't know. I mean, you know, John is the person over okay. there who's been dealing with the, <laughs> the registrations and the unenrollment. And, yeah. <clears throat> and what he just noted is, I mean, we processed something like 100 different, yeah. you know, moves of some sort this summer. They're similar to the hiring where yeah. there's just been a lot of movement. There was just a lot of movement. Okay. And I don't really, I don't know if that's an anomaly um, okay. or what to right. attribute it to. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Um, okay, and so I have just two other things here. So, did want to mention I also communicated with families um, just this afternoon. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, this Saturday is the 20th anniversary of 9/11, and. Um, so I just wanted to let families know that this year the school district is joining with Project 351, which is um, it's a service organization of middle school kids, eighth graders. The 351 refers to the 351 towns and cities in Massachusetts. Um, so Project 351 is a longstanding organization. We send an eighth grader as our rep every year. And so Project 351 has organized um, in collaboration with the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, the Mass 911 Fund, and the Massachusetts Military Heroes Fund, this event um, that they're referring to as a unifying moment of silence to honor uh, those who lost their lives on 9-11 and those who endeavored to save the lives of others. And so uh, tomorrow morning, throughout our schools, um, at the middle school and high school at 8.46 a.m., we will be um, observing a moment of silence, so principals will say a few words to sort of frame up um, the purpose, and then we'll observe a moment of silence. And at the elementary level, um, a similar thing, although they don't, they're not into class by 8.46, so when they arrive, um, sort of, you know, with their Pledge of Allegiance, um, the principals will also read a brief message, age appropriate, you know, language about um, community helpers and first responders and sort of remembering those people. Um, and we will all be at the school building committee meeting at 846 mm -hmm. <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah. So we will have an opportunity to participate in that yeah. as well. I just wanted to say, mm -hmm. I, I have kids at school uh, many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And Westwood used to have a trip every year. Mm -hmm middle of school trip and you visit West Point and different things. And they would go to I the top that. of the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. And they're up there at nine o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'll never forget when this thing happened that you know, mm -hmm. how many school kids who would have been up visiting that day, never mind the airplane that came out of Boston and, and all of the other things. And so it's a, an important thing for kids to understand the history mm -hmm. 
and they've had some great programs on television recently, one following firemen, you know, 343 firemen died going up, you know, to save people. So yeah. it's a very important thing to acknowledge and respect. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as you mentioned, Charlie, you know, for a lot of us, it was like a very, you know, sort of a flashbulb memory, right? And um, for our kids, 20 years is firmly history, right? Um, so we'll be, we'll be doing that moment of silence, but also in grades 8 and grades 11, which have connections to U.S. history and the curriculum, um, the social studies and ELA teachers will be doing some lessons about what happened on 9-11 and its impact and um, also looking at some um, first-hand accounts um, and sort of thinking about how stories are used to preserve memories and, um, and whatnot. So that is the plan. Um, and finally, uh, I, you have a memo in your packet from Lemma just about a couple of um, budget-related issues. And this is really just kind of, it, it, there's two purposes here. So the first has to do with our uses of the IDA grant offset. So that's the federal grant related to special education. Um, and we just want to uh, let you know our thinking on this. We originally in the budget planned to use the grant as an offset against special education tuition and transportation. And Lemma is suggesting that we actually use um, it differently and in fact charge our salaries for special ed IAs to that grant because um, if we use the federal grant to pay for tuition, we can then not claim it through the Medicaid reimbursement program and realize a partial reimbursement. So we think the smarter strategy financially is to use you know, budget town dollars to pay for the tuition so that we can claim them through Medi uh, Medicaid, see if we can get some partial reimbursement, and then use the offset in a different place in the budget. It, it shouldn't have any impact on the overall budget other than maybe to save us some money, right? But it's just a, a different place that we would do the accounting. So we're gonna we're gonna try it and see how it works. Exactly, it's an experiment, <laughs> and I'm gonna stay tuned. And we'll, it might be two years before we see any impact on this. So okay. we'll wait yes. to see. No. So it would potentially increase the Medicaid the reimbursement. Medicaid reimbursement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Well, that would be good. That would be mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're gonna give it a try. Um, the other part of the memo just has to do with some of these one-time federal funds that we're getting through the um, IDA American Rescue Plan. Um, so we'll be receiving $198,000 there, and then related the uh, 170K through the ESSER three funds. So that's the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. Um, it's referred to as ESSER three or ARP ESSER. <laughs> um, so this is our third round of it, right? We've uh, been through this before. The purpose is to help schools and districts um, safely reopen in some places in the country and then sort of sustain safe operations at school. So you can read, there are all kinds of um, sort of requirements about using the funds. Um, we do need to earmark at least 20% of it to address um, uh, disruption to instructional time last year and sort of the, the impact of that through implementing evidence-based interventions. And we do have to specifically look at um, students who may have been disproportionately impacted by, by COVID. Um, so we are going to have, we are, we're going to do a process this fall to consult with stakeholders. So we'll be um, using PTOs and CPAC. We also are going to put out just a survey to families. It's a quick survey to get some input about how to use this money. Our initial thinking is that that although 20% is required, we should actually spend the majority of these funds on, a, on addressing the impact instructionally from COVID. Some districts, I have to clarify, are getting millions of dollars, right? So, you know, 170K is a nice amount of money. It's not millions. Um, and so we think that's probably the best place to put it. But I just wanted to preview that for you, tell you we'll be getting some input from the community because we'll need to have a, a discussion here about the use of that, that money. Um, and the good news is, is that unlike sort of our annual budget cycles, the time frame can be extended. We actually have until September 2024 to use these funds. And so we may be looking to things that we can do in the summer. Mm -hmm. with this mm -hmm. So that's what we're thinking. Okay. So can I understand the math? 
So yeah. is it a total, is it 198, increment, 198 incremental plus 170 incremental? Yes, yeah. through okay. different sources. Yeah, different sources, but yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, that's great. Yeah, it's good. That's great. And what we have, I know you do a lot of assessments beginning of school year. <laughs> I know MCAS is a little bit different. When is MCAS, is there assessment data, in our assessment yeah. data or MCAS that can actually feed this as well? Yes, so we're, you want, you want to talk about assessment? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that. Um, so we do have prelim MCAS data from last year and we've looked at that already okay. and, and sort of lined it up to the 2019-2018 look. And, and I'll be, you know, I'm going to say this publicly, um, uh, it's not super dire in Westwood, actually, uh, especially liter literacy kind of came through pretty strongly. Where we see a little more impact is in math um, at all levels, and we're looking in particular grades where we saw more okay. as opposed to other. Um, but this year we're also um, expanding the use of STAR 360, which is a, a kind of quick assessment tool that the middle school has been using the last couple years down to K-5. to five. So we'll be using that all through K-8. to eight. Um, We've got folks getting trained uh, next Friday, and we'll be rolling that out with elementary, just so we have a little more access to sort of quick, objective, easy to use data on an ongoing basis during the school year. Okay. And that will kind of help us calibrate how we're doing. Um, so we're excited to give that a try. I think it's, it's, it's an interesting opportunity for us to um, kind of, uh, you know, get better at using data, actually, honestly, okay. um, in this district. So. Take it. And I, I would just note, we received the access test scores already for okay. students who are English language learners, and those are being sent home to parents as we speak, and that's another kind of bucket of students we would pay special attention to to, in, to think about okay. the usage of these funds. Okay. Yeah. Is, so, is there a public unveiling of MEMCAS like there has been? There, there is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, is so, up or not? Uh, so I mean, it's embargoed right now, yeah. and I, I do somewhere on my desk there is okay. the date. Okay. So, okay. but That's it's fine. coming up in September. Yeah. Okay. Um, late September, and um, as Allison said, you know, our quick look, we're we're feeling pretty good. I have to say, you know, the commissioner met with superintendents a week ago, and and the message is kind of like brace for impact when you <laughs> see your scores, and so we did. Um, and um, but we we think the news is like relatively good. Good. So, All right. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Will we be able to compare ourselves with other districts? I so that's we hope so. We hope so, <laughs> but it, it's it's hard to know. I mean, I think the way that they are going to publicly report it may be a little different this year. So all those kind of accountability measures but and we can do it ourselves. Right. Too. Well, if we can, yeah, also, it depends how they ago, release the data. There was a I think in math and science a special ed group and yeah. then the regular. Yeah. And I was very interested in comparison yeah. us with they were the special ed in some areas were no different. In other areas it's quite a bit different. Mm -hmm. And then to compare with other towns I think is a very interesting thing to kinda mm -hmm. yeah. follow. And so maybe we could be sure of doing that piece. You got it. I love mm -hmm. that you're interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will do that analysis yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That also goes right in line with the kind of Funding to we, we are required to really look at this proportionate impact, and, and we mm -hmm. want to take that really seriously. And, and some kids um, experience this pandemic differently than others. Right. So that's it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions on the updates? All right. We are moving into public participation. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this is when members of the public have an opportunity to address the school committee. Um, in person or log in um, and just a few guidelines um, if you're addressing uh, if you wish to participate we just ask that you provide your name and address um, that you address your comments to the chair um, each participant has a three minutes to speak and you'll see we do have a clock I think that's helpful um, and finally I think the way we'll do this is we'll start with with anyone in the room that wants to publicly participate and then um, we can move to the people on zoom that works. okay okay so at this time, if anyone wishes to participate, please, um, if you wouldn't mind coming forward just so you're mic'd up, that would be great. Good evening. So my name is Adrian Webb Johnson. I live at 23 Carter Street. So I've been a resident of uh, Westwood since 2004. I have uh, six kids that have gone through the school system. Um, you know, over the years, I've been fairly happy um, with the um, 
education that my children have been provided. Um, certainly over the summertime, I, uh, you know, was made aware of this memo about a DEI curriculum being instituted within the schools. I had a conversation with Ms. Borch, as I think I sent some of you emails about my concerns. Um, since that time, you know, I've had the opportunity to talk to and network with other uh, parents. And I've actually had a conversation with a teacher, a former teacher, who was let go because he didn't want to go along with this new educational movement that's being instituted at the school. Okay. Um, I find this uh, very concerning to me. Um, nobody in this room was elected with a mandate to make a radical change to the curriculum of these schools. We're all very aware of what's going on around the country as far as critical race theory. As Mr. Donahue mentioned, revisionist history that's mainly done by highly Marxist ideological professors. None of these things have any, um, do not belong in our schools and they don't belong in Westwood Public Schools. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, as, I, as I've been speaking to more and more parents, I'm hearing more and more stories um, that the, um, you know, that there's a, a, a climate in the school at this point with people uh, un afraid to express themselves as there's a lack of um, respect for ideological diversity, there's a lack of respect for people having different opinions, and I'm, I'm hearing stories, um, different things, I, you know, I'm not going to get into all those particulars at this point, but uh, I know myself and I know a lot of the parents that I talk to right now are very concerned and very upset about the things that we're hearing about what's going on. I feel like there's kind of a lack of a breakdown in trust between us and the school, you know, and you people as far as what is being taught in these schools. It does not reflect what the, t the parents in this community want. And um, we're going to have to try to figure out a way to bridge that divide here and have better communication and so that you understand and respect where we're coming from. But there are certain things that, that I know very many parents out here do not want taught in these schools. Understood? Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name is um, Tom Donilon. I live at 2 Curtis Street. Um, I got two girls in uh, high school level now. Um, I moved here in 03, um, and I want to echo and support what Adrian um, and his comments and everything that's been going on. But uh, myself and my wife, it's, it's been a difficult year, and I'm sure it has for you as well and a lot of other people. And just trying to follow or balance um, the girls going through school and, you know, with our workload as well, it's difficult, and it was difficult. Um, it's hard enough getting them up in the morning, getting them lunch and doing whatever, and getting them out the door. And then to throw in a phone where they're on that, and, you know, growing up, I'm sure all of you, you know, we didn't have phones. We sent them outside to go play. So that being said, um, I just wanted to know, and I'm sh I know there is a meeting where we are informed of a curriculum and what is going on. But, you know, what I just said earlier, it's like I get home, I'm not going looking at a curriculum. You know, I'm trying to get ready for the next day, get the girls ready, get out the door, and that's where my head is at. I just kind of have blinders on. I'm always on the assumption that, and I, I did nine years parochial. So um, that being said, you always had the arithmetic reading and writing. And that's my assumption. And then when I hear these other stories about what's going on with the curriculum these days, it is worrisome and it is concerning. And there is a lot of Westwood parents. So my concern is, is there another meeting where we can inform parents, Westwood parents, not only Westwood parents, Westwood residents of what's going on in the schools these days? Because, you know, Westwood is a great community. And, you know, we want to always be different and from other communities and better, and we strive to be that way. Um, so that being said, I don't know if you can answer that now or if we can, 
inform parents of what's going on. I mean, sex ed in the parochial school, I don't think I learned until seventh grade when I was 12. And I'm hearing stories of first graders coming home with transgender books. So that being said, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eileen Siegel and I live at 257 Alder Road. Um, I appreciate that you addressed this at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I still think it's important that I share my statement and I always welcome any conversations with my fellow parents in the community. I'm speaking tonight as a resident, property owner, and taxpayer in Westwood. I'm a mother, I'm a middle school public educator, a Catholic, and a heterosexual ally to the LGBTQ community. Tonight, I'm using my voice because there is a loud minority I cannot ignore. I moved to Westwood because of the school system and to raise my family here. Children deserve to feel safe, included, cared about, and free to live their truth. As a community, we must embrace all children, not just the children who conform to dominant norms of the past. As a community, we need to focus on raising our children to be kind, thoughtful, and to embrace differences. That includes ensuring all our children, no matter their sexual orientation, gender identity, skin color, personal challenges, or cultural differences, feel safe, accepted, and welcome in our community. I urge this committee to acknowledge these facts. According to data from the 2019 Massachusetts Youth Risk Behavior Survey of LGBTQ plus youth, 19.9% attempted suicide compared to 4.5% of heterosexual youth. 29.8% of LGBTQ plus youth were bullied on school property and 23.8% were bullied electronically. Variation in our humanity is one of the greatest gifts we have. By having diverse and inclusive policies that welcome the whole youth in schools, we make our community stronger. Our children will be kind and loving to all who they meet. They will excel wherever they go with these skills we give them. I urge you engage in this change, not with a fear forward approach, but with hope and love for what we can create together. I am asking this committee to acknowledge that there is a divide in this community and an intolerance of LGBTQ plus folks is present. I have searched the Westwood Public School webpage and there is no mention of diversity, inclusion, and equity in the core values. By not publicly stating that these are part of our values, we are screaming they are not. We have a responsibility to respond with confidence and finality that Westwood is an inclusive community. We respect and embrace our diversity and we will not consider goals that do not align with those values. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else in the room that would like to participate? Okay, please come down. Good evening. Um, my name is Ken Fascaldo, 35 Norfolk Ave, Westwood, Mass. My wife and I um, do not have anybody in the school system at this time. We are, have two children that went through the Westwood schools and four grandchildren that are going through the Westwood schools. It has um, come to my attention that things that are being fostered in the schools are um, going, making some of the students feel um, that they are a problem, that because they aren't diver in the diverse group, they're not being included, whether it be politically, sexually, um, or whatever. And I think that we've gone too far in trying to um, make everybody feel welcome, which we should, but in so doing, it's be made some kids not feel welcome, that they are a problem just because they don't fit into a diverse minority group. We should definitely be inclusive. Everybody should be involved. But at the same time, we shouldn't be alienating other children. I'm happy to hear that the school committee is going to review some of the curriculum that's changes that have been made. I'm quite frankly disappointed. Um, the school committee are elected representatives and I would have expected them to have been involved in curriculum changes, uh, diversity events that are going on, and um, give their approval as representatives of the community. So I don't know why that hasn't happened in the past, but I'm glad to hear that it's gonna happen going forward. 
but it's a little bit late for things that have already been taken, already have taken place, and that is disappointing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Hello, Heather Morrison, 74 Magnolia Drive. It's amazing to see all you in person now. This is so, <laughs> this is so much better. Um, so anyways, uh, I am here to say, first of all, thank you for um, all the updates at the beginning of the meeting. That was all very helpful. I would also like to give a huge shout out to Extend a Day and Morning Care. It is a lifesaver for working families, and we are so grateful it is back this year. I can't tell you how thankful we are and I agree Michael's doing a great job so far so thank you um, I'm also very excited that we are doing the test and stay program I know as Emily mentioned that the program is a bit of a mess right now and I know that from personal experience it's slow going but I do hope that it will get on its feet and it'll be a great program to keep all of our kids in school which is what is most important and so I'm very grateful that that is underway now um, I would I just voice my concern about lunch. I really would like to see all the kids at tables. I, I, as you said, those, those middle schoolers are so happy to be at tables. And I think that if we could, again, maybe just on inclement weather days, use those tables in the elementary schools rather than having the kids sit on the floor to eat lunch. Uh, you know, it's going to be a long winter. They're not going to be outside, 10 or not, when it's below zero. So... I, I, that's one thing I would really love to see improve. Um, and my last point is just, um, I know we're not probably gonna talk about masks today because from the last meeting, um, Desi issued the mandate for masks until October 1, and then with whatever metrics they come up with, and I would just ask right now because we won't have another meeting until after that, is that um, you consider, I strongly urge you to follow the Desi plan is that the metrics that they provide and the plan that they provide is being vetted by experts across the state. Um, and honestly, for the worst case scenario, and Westwood's not a worst case scenario. You guys have said that in a million different ways already. Our vaccine rates are great. Our kids are great. Like everything is good. So let's not go above and beyond in that respect. Let's not try to create our own complicated metrics. Let's try to keep it simple. Let's try to get everybody back to normal as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Is there anyone else in the room that we should say anything? No? Okay. Should we go to the phones? All right. So what am I doing? So you're, oh, you're, your hands. Okay. Um, first in line, Mandy Taft Pierman. adjusting to the pandemic and keeping the kids safe. Um, I wanted to follow up on a few of the earlier comments just to offer a counterpoint of parents who are very supportive of and committed to the district's commitment to um, DEI work, uh, not necessarily critical race theory. That's a buzzword being used these days, I think, to um, get people thinking it's more than it is, but, but DEI work meaning how are our schools inclusive and welcoming for everybody? How do we educate our kids and what an excellent education looks like these days in terms of taking the perspectives of others, understanding experiences of those who may not have had the same history or past that you did. Um, I think for many of us who are in the majority, which I am in many ways, I'm a white woman, um, it can be uncomfortable to start to question some of the stories we've always heard or the ways we've understood the world. Um, and I think that that's part of what learning is about these days. It's, it, it's not easy, it's not comfortable. Um, but I, for one, and a number of parents that have sent supportive letters to the district and such in the past are grateful that Westwood is taking um, this opportunity to say, what does an excellent education look like right now? How do we prepare kids to engage in a multiracial global society where they need to engage across lines of difference and understand perspectives of those others than them? Um, I'll also just speak as a member of a two-mom family, an LGBTQ family. Um, I think, uh, you know, Respectfully to those of you who have referenced things, I'd ask you to do a little bit of homework. Transgender uh, individuals are people who it's about their gender identity. That is not a sex ed topic. That is about um, one's identity that can be, you know, an issue for toddlers and up. Um, there are transgender and LGBTQ students in our district. Um, our commitment to 
recognizing and welcoming and supporting all kids and families in our district necessitates that we recognize we have a diverse community. We have immigrant families, we have LGBTQ families, families of color, white families, religious families, families of kids with special needs, and we all have to move in and try to understand what other communities, other uh, populations may have experienced and what they need for support. Um, and that is part of what it means to be uh, an excellent school district in, in, in the day and age that we are in. Um, so I, I welcome the school committee and the public's awareness of and engagement in um, how the schools are evolving, but I urge us to um, really try to each open our minds and listen to what others are saying and what communities that are different than your own may feel they need and um, appreciate the work of the district leadership and the school committee to continue this work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is Martha Sullivan. Hi, this is Martha Sullivan from 421 Pearl Street. Um, I'm also going to um, speak in support of the um, district's uh, DEI efforts. Um, I want to make sure that it's clear that um, you know this stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, again, like Mandy mentioned, I know that there are a lot of media buzzwords. Um, however, you know, I think uh, I would hope that many of us would be hard pressed to say that we are against diversity, equity, and inclusion of our town's population. Um, this is representing the people that are in Westwood um, and including them. And that's that's really the goal. And from what I understand of the, um, the memos and the communications that have been discussed at the school committee meetings and that have been issued, um, it is that the school district is investigating how to best serve the needs of the district in these in these issues. You know, there's it's not um, you know again you know it's not critical race theory. You know that's that's a, that's one example, but you know investigating curriculum options is is not that necessarily. Um, and I would also agree that our students need to have a modern curriculum that um, prepares them for the real world in a way that is appropriate to our times. Um, so again, you know, I would just like to uh, express my support to the school district for looking into how um, how this curriculum can be uh, integrated into all of the levels at age appropriate levels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christina Martin. Christina, you there? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. We got you. Okay. Christina Martin, 23 Brookfield Road. Um, I would like to follow up on something one of the earlier speakers said about communicating with the community. Um, and I think that's actually a great idea because I think a lot of people don't understand what the conversations actually sound like that are going on in the classrooms. Um, as someone said, we came up in a really different school system. We learned really different things, we missed out on this stuff. So it would be a great opportunity for parents to learn um, a lot more about diversity, different ways we talk about inclusion, who that means, who is impacted, um, the, the very negative impacts of not being included on students um, and not having their existence acknowledged in their everyday life. So um, I don't disagree with that speaker that parents definitely could, could use to, to learn a lot more. We, frankly, we're new students at this type of thing. Um, I also want to address some of the stuff that's come up with sex ed. I have been one of the parents who has 
actually contacted the district looking for a more expansive sex ed program. Um, when my two oldest kids went through the fifth grade, you know, like your body workshop, I realized it was the exact same material, more or less, that I got 30 years ago. It's, it's um, scientifically accurate, but somewhat outdated. Um, and not too long ago, I heard a, a TED Talk by a CEO um, of an organization called Culture Reframed, who made some really important points about sex education. Um, according to their website, one third of young people have seen pornography by the age of 12, and it often depicts violence against women. So if we don't talk with our kids about these things before they see it, that is what they learn and normalize. Um, it's totally uncomfortable for me. I did not grow up in an open household. I'm working really hard to be more open with my own children. But that talk really blew my mind and made me realize that I just need to get over myself um, and have these important conversations for both my sons and my daughter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Antigone Grasso. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we got gotcha. you. Great. Um, thanks. I wanted to say um, my comments tonight are focused around two questions that I'm hoping you can answer. The first is why does Westwood Public Schools still have a medical advisory working group overriding state guidance? And two, if the school committee's goal is to return our schools to a normal environment, are you benchmarking our schools against towns that are implementing normal protocols? On my first point, why are you keeping the medical advisory group in place? And on what basis is this group more qualified than the Massachusetts Department of Public Health to develop public health practices for Westwood? As you know, the DESE guidance is developed in conjunction with the Massachusetts DPH. This is the very same DPH that has guided public health matters for the entire state since 1869. And yet, for some reason, medical guidance from these state experts is suddenly not good enough for Westwood Public Schools. You have insisted on keeping this redundant infrastructure in place this year, recreating public health guidance instead of focusing your efforts on what you've been elected to do, which is implementing educational guidance issued by the state. Please stop overruling the state experts. You all do not know better. I'm also extremely concerned about comments made at last month's school meeting, school committee meeting by one of the doctors who sits on the medical advisory group. He stated that one of the reasons he was advocating for masking in schools was because, and I quote, we have to do our best to end this disease, end quote. Let's all be very clear. There is no end to this virus. COVID will always be with us. So any, having anyone medically advising Westwood Public Schools who says that masking kids can help to put an end to this virus is very concerning. On my second point, I'd like to know which towns you all are using as benchmarks for how schools should actually look. As Emily presented earlier, Westwood's vaccination rate is extremely high. In fact, Westwood continues to rank in the top 20 towns across Massachusetts in vaccination rates. Top 20 out of 350 towns. We should be celebrating this wonderful accomplishment and our school protocols should reflect this fact. Having virtual curriculum nights, middle schoolers logging into Chromebooks for contact tracing when they have to use the bathroom or elementary students eating lunch on dirty gym floors are not protocols I would expect from the school board given where the town is. Other towns have adapted much more normal practices and we should follow suit. In short, I'm requesting that you disband the medical advisory working group, follow the DESE guidance that comes out and leverage practices from other towns that will bring a normal school environment back to our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Megan Brink. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Great. 
My name is Megan Brank. I live at 47 Briar Lane. And I would like to take this moment to thank you all for your continued focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in our schools. I know that your work in this area made for a more positive start to the school year for many of our students at multiple levels. Whether you're raising a student who is neurodiverse, racially diverse, culturally diverse, part of the LGBTQ plus community, or simply just doesn't fit the mold, parents should know that their student will feel comfortable in school and therefore, therefore be ready and available to learn. Many of us parents don't even know we are raising a diverse child until after they're born. Knowing they're embraced and celebrated in our community is so important. I'm so grateful for this Westwood Village. Finally, most major corporations have whole departments dedicated to DEI work, and I'm glad that Westwood Public Schools are preparing our students for the real world. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, we're at the 30 minute mark, which as you know, is our, <laughs> Um, the maximum time. Um, I will entertain a motion to extend public participation. How many people do we have in the queue? We've got four people in the queue. So, um, so we want to extend another 15 minutes? I'd make a motion to extend for only those four people and no okay. repeat. Is that, so for whatever time it takes for those 12 four. minutes? Yeah, 12 so minutes. So just for the four, yes. 12 minutes? I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so we are extending for these four people, and the first one is Donna Morrison. <clears throat> Donna, you there? My name is Donna Morrison, 303 Oak Street. I'd like to thank you all for your continued hard work in keeping our children safe in school. I would like to address the concussive policy that you will be discussing later on. As a person who is recuperating from a concussion currently, third week, um, I don't want you to just rubber stamp this. I want you to really thoroughly think it through and think of the students that are not just athletes, but students that are in our diverse Donna, did we lose you? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? We got you back. Yes. Students that are in our students that are in our school system that suffer concussion for various reasons, not just from athletics, but maybe from illness or something like that, that may need extra time out of school. Um, I, I really want you to think this policy over. Um, these are the kids that are most susceptible to this. And um, I just want you to think it through. And I, again, I just want you to, um, I just want to thank you for all your time and effort in um, the opening of the school year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, next up we have Melissa Morabito. Hope I said that right. Yes, you did. Um, Melissa Morabito, uh, 299 Canton Street. Um, I also wanted to thank the committee for all their work and also to express my support for the DEI efforts. I have to say that they are absolutely necessary to prepare our children for, to be successful in the world and that DEI is a part of a complete education, right? With reading and math and writing and all of the things that we all learned in school. But beyond the benefits, I think it's also important that we make sure that all of our students know that they are welcome and included in the Westwood schools. Um, we are a public school system and we serve everybody um, and everybody should know that they are welcome. So um, I appreciate the efforts and I, I hope we we're doing more. So thank you so much. Thank you. And next up we have Rania Kelly. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Hello, my name is Rania Kelly. I live at 20 Blue Hill Drive. I wanted to thank um, the committee and the teachers. You all do a wonderful job. I um, 
grew up in Westwood. I went through the school system. Now I have an eight-year-old going through it. And I, I really appreciate the DEI efforts that are going on. I know that um, as a person of color, it was a different time back then, and I hope we support immigrant communities and people, the, the school-age kids of color, as well as LGBTQ. I had a sibling who was gay that went through the um, Westwood school system, so I saw the impact that had on that sibling. And, and I know many young students that are going through the public school system now who are LGBTQ and deserve to be respected. And I think what's most important is I remember being, you know, this country was also built by women, also built by immigrants. Um, and I hope those stories are being told in history lessons. And, um, you know, I'm in corporate America, and corporate America is embracing DEI. And if we want our children to be ready to prosper in the world and be able to work with LGBTQ, those with disabilities, those are, that are neurodivergent, those who do come from different countries, we are not doing our children a service if we do not teach them how to live, work, play with those communities. They will be left behind. So thank you. I won't even take the whole three minutes. Thank you. Um, and finally, our last caller is Steph Body. Hi, this is Steph Bati. I live at 156 Sunrise Road. Um, I wanted to thank you all um, for a successful start to school. Um, you know, I really appreciate continuing to wear masks at school, continuing to have the testing program at school. Um, it helps me and my family feel much safer um, so that we can have a successful school year. Um, I also wanted to thank you for the focus you put on expanding our curriculum to include more DEI efforts um, and request that more structures provided to our teacher and staff going forward. I think we have a good start in place, but we can do more. Um, I have two children at the Sheehan School, and last June they celebrated pride in their classrooms. And I heard from teachers, neighbors, and friends that the conversations were beautiful and gave the students an opportunity to share about their families and to learn from each other. Um, and I find that when my children read books about families with two moms or a transgender child or immigrants, it helps them understand and learn and be part of creating a welcoming environment which is what I want for my children and what I want for our community. Um, so I agree that the school committee needs to make it clear that our community stands for inclusion in all forms. Leaving these values out is not staying neutral. It's excluding a huge part of our community and telling them that they're not welcome. Um, I thank you for facilitating these conversations because um, as an earlier um, person stated, it does, um, you know, support the efforts to decrease bullying in our school um, as well. So again, you know, our LGBTQ students are not just in our middle school and in our high school, they're in our elementary schools as well. You know, we have transgender students within our community um, and supporting them and teaching the people around them um, provides an environment where we feel safe. So thank you. Thank you. Um, that concludes public participation. So we are going to move on to the chair update and liaison reports. Um, <coughs> starting first with the school building project update. Um, so we are getting close to the town meeting vote for the new Hanlon Deerfield Elementary School. Uh, we plan to have one more community forum. Um, where the whole community can come and hear about the project and ask questions and provide feedback. And so I encourage everyone to attend that. It's really the best way to learn about the project because we go through each each point in, you know, we'll give a presentation where we go through each each point of the project in detail. Um, and then the, the really key part of that is when people are able to zoom in and ask questions. So we'll announce that date shortly. We don't have quite, I don't think we're finalized on the date yet. I think it's going to be October 14th. Okay, but it's <coughs> probably going to be October 14th. <laughs> um, so mark your calendars and then mark your calendars for the town meeting October 18th. 
and the special election October 26th. And if any students here are registered to vote, I encourage you to go to town meeting because it is really an interesting example of local democracy at work. <laughs> and you can go even if you. If you, you can go even if visitor, you're not registered, visitor, right? Yeah. It's, but if you're registered, you can actually vote. Yeah. So, and the way we vote at town meeting is you literally yell out yes, which <laughs> still baffles me, but that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. So, um, or no, you can yell no too. I should say. Um, and I think that's it for the school building. I'm not going to belabor it. So I'm going to turn it over to Tony for the COVID-19 advisory group update. Yeah, so I'll do the next two. And just <clears throat> on the um, town meeting, just a reminder, it's going to be at 5 p.m. Is that correct, Maya? 5 p.m. Oh, yes, Flay sorry. High. 5 p.m. outside yeah. on the Flay High Field. So I know it's a little early, but um, mark your calendars. Babysitters will be available. And it's the only thing on the agenda. Right. It's so literally you show up and we start talking about it. We talk, we vote, you go home. So I'll be brief on the next two. So the COVID-19 um, advisory, um, we actually haven't met in a little while. We wanted to get a few weeks into the school year. Um, I think as we've heard conversations, we're hoping that DESI will provide additional guidance on metrics for um, the uh, masking besides the vaccination rates, because that I think would be helpful for some of the comments we heard tonight. It would be obviously be helpful if we had some statewide metrics. So more to come, but we had, there hasn't been a lot of update. We wanted to see how the first few weeks went. Um, then on the school start times subcommittee, um, just brief context. We've talked about this a lot over the last several years at the school committee. Um, what this is about is really taking a look at um, kind of secondary start times. As many of you follow this, there's a wealth of um, peer-reviewed studies that indicate it benefits kids' physical, mental, um, social, emotional, as well as um, there's actually academic success. Um, and some people seem to be citing the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm glad to hear that people are citing it because they've actually recommended an 8.30 start time for seven years for, um, for secondary education. So I'm glad we're gonna be tackling this important public health um, topic. Um, it may not, not benefit the seniors, but I hope it will benefit future <laughs> generations of uh, children. Um, the basic, you know, so what I'm just highlighting today to let the community know about it. I think, you know, as we talked with the superintendent and the team, our hope is actually to move relatively quickly um, to develop a set of recommendations, I think, by the end of this school calendar. Um, this has been done in many neighboring communities. The research is pretty clear. It's really about looking at options, engaging the community, um, and thinking about what the path forward is to be this. So to that end, we will be looking for, um, you know, probably a handful, one to two parents to be part of this committee. If you're interested in, in listening, uh, please reach out to me or the superintendent. Um, Amanda will be joining me on this committee from the, the school committee. So looking forward, and we will be back in future meetings as we get into this. So Great. That's it. Thank you, Tony. Is there anyone else who wants to report on a liaison? Just a quick plug for CPAC. They're getting back up and running for the year. There's a Popsicle Social on, oh, I'm sorry, on the 19th at 2 o'clock at Sheehan, I believe. And all are welcome, um, parents, kids, families, everybody. Great. Anything else? Nope. Okay. I'm actually going to jump out of order here um, for discussion items. We're going to start with the, I think, what's the most interesting thing on this list, which is our Senior Independent Project mm -hmm. Program, mm -hmm. which is why we have these guys here. Oh, so I'm very patient. Yes, <laughs> Thank you for your patience, and I'm turning it over to Great. all of you. So I'm going to introduce you to Catherine Stewart, who is the teacher who uh, led the student independent project program, which we call SIP, this summer. Uh, Catherine is also our humanities department head at Thurston Middle School. And you're going to say a bit about the program, right? So I will yeah. just turn it over to you. Great. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Emily said, my name is Catherine Stewart. I'm the senior independent project uh, program coordinator at the high school and the humanities department chair at Thurston. Um, I'd like to begin by extending my sincere thanks uh, to the school committee for hosting us this evening, uh, to Superintendent Parks, to Assistant Superintendent Forchers, and also to uh, Westwood High School Principal Amy Davenport for their support of the SIP program. I've been involved with SIP since 2018. And in that time, I have come to recognize what if as the sort of unofficial essential question of the program. 
Those two simple words are often a gateway to individual student projects, and they also serve as stepping stones that help students uh, progress with their ideas throughout the year. Now, among uh, the many unforeseen changes brought by the pandemic was the knowledge that SIP would be taking a hiatus. And while I recognized the reality of the situation, I also knew in my heart that SIP needed to return. Um, so in January, when Amy Davenport approached me and asked, what if we <laughs> ran SIP as a summer elective, I immediately jumped at the chance. Uh, soon you will hear from 12 students who agreed to be part of this grand experiment that was taking a year-long experience and distilling it into a single summer. Uh, but before you do, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what has brought them here. So in March, we ran a series of info sessions, advertising SIP and explaining what a summer program might look like. In April and May, students submitted applications, sat for a series of interviews with high school faculty, and were notified of their acceptance into the program. In June, I met with each student individually to begin their mentor research process. Students were required to bring to this meeting a list of three potential mentors and their contact information. And these could be anybody from my neighbor who works in a field that I am curious about, to pie in the sky, I've never met this person before, but I found them in my research and their job title sounds so cool. Uh, and then in late June, stretching into July and into early August, these 12 students embarked on self-directed projects. We met weekly via Zoom, often from all over the place and in multiple countries, developing criteria for success based on SIP's core values, learning about mission statements, and then eventually writing their own, and forming personalized action plans that helped students to figure out what they needed to do in order to get where they wanted to go. And of course, we constantly pushed each other to ask over and over and over again, what if? So it is with great pride and appreciation that I invite these students to share their projects with you this evening. Bria, come on up. Hi, committee. Um, my name is Ria Danny, and for this project, I was really passionate about microbiology and the idea of using technology and scientific research to benefit the healthcare industry. So my mission statement for this project was to engage in the process of conducting mutagenesis research by working hands-on with my mentor in her lab to gain knowledge and experience to help me understand the field of genetics that I'm interested in pursuing in the future. So over the summer, I worked with Professor Dr. Susan Lovett, who is the head of the Lovett Lab at Brandeis University, a lab that specializes in mutagenesis, which is the process of genetic, mutation, genetic mutations and analyzing them, um, which was a really interesting topic for me. So I worked with one of her grad students on the current project of experimenting how a protein called YOA-A impacts the rate of a specific mutation in E. coli. Um, and not only was this a really cool experience, I learned lab skills such as operating centrifuges or autoclaves. And I also got to know a bunch of the lab members personally and heard about their motivations for going into, into the scientific research field, as well as their advice for teenagers such as myself who are interested. Um, so throughout this project, I had to prep for lab meetings and going into the lab generally. So a lot of what I had to do was background readings, which were in the form of research papers. And reading these papers was quite an unexpected challenge for me. So as a final project, I decided to write an article called How to Read a Scientific Research Paper, um, adding in some of my own experiences and tips for reading to help other teenagers who are wanting to explore hard scientific topics or wanting to just read research papers in general to kind of help them struggle a little bit less than I did. So overall, this project really helped me gain clarity and knowledge about my own future, hopefully now in research, um, and through out SIP and in the future, I'm planning to continue writing articles, going into labs, and just learning more before I end up in that field, hopefully myself. Thank you. Thank you. 
Oh, uh, we have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to say we can ask questions. There's well, no grilling. <laughs> have you read the book Codebreaker? I have. I, I just got it. I just returned it to the library a couple months ago. Oh, I just wanted to be sure that. Uh... <laughs> Don't worry. Love that book. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. All right, Owen. Hi, my name is Owen Dutton. I'm passionate about the medical field and specifically first aid. And with SIP, I wanted to not only expand my own knowledge, but also make a difference in the community and potentially save lives. With this, I decided on the uh, mission statement. I will engage my, or I will enhance my ability to teach first aid through independent research and by training to be an American Red Cross CPR instructor in order to enable students in my community to take action during a medical emergency and save lives. So the process of becoming a CPR instructor was very confusing and difficult to navigate, but I was lucky enough to have the support of my mentor, Heidi Brock, who was actually the instructor who taught me the base level CPR certification. So she was able to provide me with a lot of uh, insight along the way and help navigating the steps. The first step that I took was I did a lot of, I read a lot of resources from the Red Cross to review my personal skills in first aid. So as an Eagle Scout, I have a lot of previous skills, but I wanted to make sure that I was really up to speed enough to be able to share these, this information with a class and with other students. The next step is that I took a class at a Red Cross facility in order to become certified to actually teach for them. Uh, this class was about 16 hours over two days, and I learned the techniques to effectively teach CPR and first aid and also the opportunity to practice teaching in front of my peers at the class. And an interesting aspect about this class is that all of the other attendees besides myself were adults who were already in the medical field. So it was so interesting to hear their experience and hear their stories, and that was really inspiring for me. The final step of this process was a long struggle to become affiliated with the Red Cross <coughs> so, so that I could legally teach under their name. This process was very frustrating and marked with countless unreturned emails, <laughs> but I think really taught me a lot, a big lesson in uh, networking and communication. But I was eventually, after about three weeks, able to overcome this obstacle and teach my first class on August 21st, where I certified eight students to perform CPR, use an AED, and do first aid. And this class was super fun, and I think everybody was engaged the entire time and left the class knowing how to take action in any medical emergency. So I definitely hope to continue teaching these classes in the future. Thank you. Do we have opportunity for him to well, teach our say, students? That's great to know. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. always looking for people. Yeah. 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 Written your name down, Owen. Yeah. We might need some training. Yeah. 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 Everybody should have it. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Happy to teach classes. Yeah. I know. Hi, my name is Angelina Dong. Over the past year and with the rise of the pandemic, there has been an immense increase in xenophobia and racism towards the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. With this in mind and with my passion of exploring social justice and inequality, I decided to organize a virtual 5K or one mile walk or run for Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center, otherwise known as BCNC. Before planning my event, I came up with my mission statement, which was, I will fundraise for Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center by organizing a virtual 5K or one mile walk or one. By doing this, I will spread awareness of the rise in anti-Asian sentiment and help those impacted in order to foster a more inclusive, greater Boston community. With the help of my mentor, whose name was John Eng, and his previous experience organizing virtual events, I learned how to create a registration and donation collecting website. John is currently on the Quincy Leadership Council of BCNC, and he helped me connect with the nonprofit and also other key members of their organization, such as the financial development team and the CEO. After reaching out to many people and other organizations, creating posters to help me promote my event and spreading the word about it, I was able to raise just over $1,000 for BCNC with the help of over 50 participants and supporters. The donations will directly be used to help the local AAPI communities who are negatively impacted by the pandemic. With all of this being said, I believe I was able to successfully spread awareness of the rise in anti-Asian sentiment and at the same time, learn the logistics behind organizing a virtual event and working with a nonprofit. Thank you.
process more difficult than you thought or easier or, or would you do it again? <laughs> I would definitely do it again. Um, I think it was a bit, it was a bit more challenging than I thought, like getting the donation set up. We had to work around, um, my original plan was to donate to Stop AAPI Hate, which is a yep. more national organization. But due to difficulties, I ended up going with a more local organization. Yeah. Great. Good job. Thank you. Hi, my name is Quinn O'Brien. This summer with SIP, I focus on the education system. Although that is a broad topic, with the help of my mentor, we narrowed it down to the psychology in school and the importance of relationships in school. My mission statement was I'll improve my knowledge on the importance of relationships within education. And with the help of my mentor, I'll be researching learning theories and the psychology behind them. Throughout the project, my mentor, Chandler Creedon, was a great help. He's worked in many schools and was a substitute school psychologist for the year at Westwood. Each week I do independent research, then meet with him at the end of the week, at week and talk about what I learned. He helped me think in ways that were outside the box, which led to the root of my project, which was how might a space <coughs> creature react or look at the American public school system. <laughs> <laughs> Building off this idea, I looked into learning theories that might be best for the space creature. I found that both the Bandura theory and Bronfenbrenner theory might suit the space creature best. Another reoccurring idea both me and Mr. Creedon had was the importance of relationships in school, whether it's teacher-student or student-student. I was able to incorporate this into my project by explaining how a teacher might best build a relationship with the space creature. Part of my research led <coughs> me to Dr. Nadine Gabb, who studies brain function as it relates to learning disabilities. I was able to set up a time to meet with her and discuss her work and what I've learned in my own research. When I met with her, I had solid opinions about my research. I was able to ask her many questions about her work and her answer changed the way I looked at learning styles. Her research proves that people don't learn in one way, which is a common myth within education. Lastly, with SIP, I was able to get out of my comfort zone and learn something I'm very passionate about. Thank you. So did you, did you feel like your, the things that you learned sort of spilled over into your family life, like with your parents, maybe? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Are you thinking about becoming a teacher or an educator? Uh, maybe. Yeah. I haven't. It would be interesting, too. Well, we'll keep us in mind. How? <laughs> you definitely don't become a school committee member. Hi, my name is Caroline Kundrat, and for my SIP project, I decided to focus on um, graphic design and writing. And my mission statement was, I will research graphic design, subculture, and writing to self-publish a zine that caters to my interests and spreads them to people that would otherwise not know about the chosen subject. And the chosen subject was industrial music, which um, I'm a huge fan of, and I was very passionate about. So it was industrial very- Industrial music? Yeah. <laughs> Something for me to Google later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's why I made the zine, so that people could find out about it. Oh, we should read it. I can read about it. We need yeah. the link. <laughs> um, my mentor was Phoenix Lai, who was a Pratt Institute graduate for graphic design, and um, I talked with her a lot about what programs I should use, and she helped me a lot with that. I used InDesign, which was very foreign to me, so it was a very steep learning curve. And, um, well, originally my cover was supposed to be in the corner of the um, slide, but it didn't make it in. <laughs> okay. um, it was definitely the first time I had ever done something like this, to write so many articles and self-publish something. And I'd literally never done anything like it before, so some challenges I faced were I had to figure out what exactly to put into the zine, um, like what articles and what pictures, and um, 
I actually collaborated with some people online to help me with the articles and submit some, but in the end I still had to cut out a lot of content because it just wouldn't be doable in um, a way that I would be pleased with uh, within the constraints of the deadline. Um, so I learned a lot about, um, <laughs> I learned that I'm not really that into graphic design that much, <laughs> which is a really good realization because uh, that was kind of the whole point of the project um, was to figure out what I liked and what I didn't like and um, do something new that I wouldn't normally do in school. And um, even though I'm not too passionate about it anymore, um, I still like experiencing this project and producing the zine, and I'm very thankful for the opportunity. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. I love your point about learning what you don't, what you're not interested in. I mean, that's that's a, a lot of experiences are, th are that way, and it's a great thing. Right? It's not bad to find out that you know what this really doesn't do anything for me, and you move on. So you're way ahead of the game. Because a lot of people do that in college and, and beyond, and and much later. So, mm -hmm. and I would like to, to read the scene. So I'm going to yeah. email you tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. How do we? How do we? Um, I will. I will. With all how do stuff. people get access to that? I mean, to uh, it's through a link. Uh, yeah. Just like, yeah. Just just like I will get the okay. link and I'll send. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Will Hanson. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. When we began this project last spring, I wanted to focus on one of my dearest passions, and that's sports. And knowing how important exercise is, especially for younger kids, I wanted to help other people and bring sports to a wide variety of audiences, uh, especially kids in the city who maybe don't have the resources or the money to get exercise. I wanted to run some sort of clinic that would bring them outside of the city and get exercise that they needed. Uh, this, unfortunately, did not come to fruition because mainly there were already a lot of programs in place that did exactly this, and it seemed like what I wanted to do wasn't really necessary. And so in the middle of the course, about halfway through, I completely pivoted my project and turned to something that I personally want to pursue, probably in college and beyond, and that's business. And so I quickly formed a plan that would allow me to research as much as I could, both business specifically and how to learn more in the future. And so the most key component of this was interviews. And I reached out to numerous people, and a lot of them got back. And I was able to interview people from corporate executives to salespeople. And the biggest thing I learned was that not necessarily the specifics of business, but the intangibles of the competition and how you can balance trying to be your best self while still helping other people. And so in the end, I wanted a way to bring this all back to a medium that I could present. And so I turned back to my original sports idea, and I didn't want to give up on that. So I, when I was researching sports business, which is a multi-billion dollar entity, I found that most of the information was wedged deep in hour-long podcasts or deep in the bottom of expansive websites. So I brought this to the forefront of just making a simple website that contains all the basics and links for uh, more in-depth research uh, so anyone can go look at it and find basic info instead of having to dig through specific podcasts and other longer websites. And so overall, this the drastic shift in the middle of the project definitely challenged me, uh, along with interviews. I interviewed some people that are way more high up than anybody I've ever talked to. Um, and But yeah, in the end, I learned not just the specifics of business, but also how to learn about it, how to conduct interviews, and how to keep advancing my knowledge in the future. So thank you. Thank you. So it seems like you mentioned you talked to like really high up people, and everybody had made some really cool connections, it seems like, and maybe even nationally. So how did you guys do that? Was it like personal networking, or were you just cold calling people? How were you able to connect with all of these professionals and mentors? I know for a lot of other people, they just reached out blindly to people that they found right. online. Uh, right. I personally had some family connections that yes. I reached out to that I, I don't know if I'd ever talked to some of them. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, that was really interesting to talk to a lot of those people. But yeah, I know a lot of people did just reach out blindly. Neat. Awesome. And is Thanks. your website up and running? Yeah, it is. We can link it. So we'd it. love that link, link too. Mm -hmm. I'll get that okay. well. We need lots of links. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Right. Great. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eliana Hutchins, and I've always been interested in medicine, 
but my interest peaked throughout the last year as I explored more fields and research. For my project, I spent the summer interning in the outpatient oncology ward at Massachusetts General Hospital. My mission statement that I presented at the beginning of my project was, I will work with my mentor to obtain first-hand experience interacting with cancer patients in a hospital while using my observations and research to create a website centered around a new type of cancer treatment, CAR T-cell therapy. My main, my main mentor was Meredith Saylor, who's a nurse practitioner, also my cousin, mm -hmm. at Mass General. However, I was able to shadow multiple other healthcare professionals as well, such as a doctor, registered nurse, nurse practitioner, and physician's assistant. I spent at least a day with each role observing patient-doctor interactions and procedures, including a lumbar puncture and a bone marrow biopsy, which are both pictured up there if you don't think it's too gross. <laughs> Um, I gathered my observations as well as the research I did outside of the hospital on cancer therapies and compiled a website on, a new on the new theory as my final project. Almost all of the patients I interacted with had uh, received this treatment and asking them about it helped me gain an important and personal perspective for my website. I am glad that my experience at the hospital wasn't filtered. I was able to watch the best moments when a patient is told they are cancer free and the worst moments when someone is told that therapy did not work and there's no cure. I'm grateful to have had this experience to explore the medical field. It definitely furthered my interest and I hope to continue it as a career. Thank you. So that's a hard field. And I'm impressed that you were able to, I mean, going into a cancer outpatient clinic is difficult. So was that, did that affect you at all? Or were you, did it make you more determined to help this, this population or? Sort of, were you scared of it? Like, how, what was your reaction to that? Um, I mean, definitely sad, of course. But going in, I met a lot of patients who actually had such a positive outlook on life, and that really inspired me. And in how, despite the fact that they could possibly die soon, um, they really did want to take in every moment and enjoy every aspect of life, which definitely inspired me to do the same in my own life. Wow, that's great. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello and good evening. Um, my name is Sai, and this summer, I kind of wanted to um, explore possible majors in college. And for context, I was kind of like undecided on what I wanted to do. So uh, I kind of decided to do multiple internships um, throughout the summer. Uh, however, two of them I did not know I was going to do. I was only going to do one of them uh, in the beginning of my SIP project. And that was, um, I guess, the first internship. And that was under the um, mentorship of Milana Vasudev, Professor Milana Vasudev, in the department, department of Bioengineering at UMass Dartmouth. And um, while I was there, I got to uh, shadow different undergraduate students and graduate students. It was kind of valuable to um, watch them do their work. Uh, and I guess there, the project they're working on in the summer was uh, anti-biofouling, um, especially the bioengineering department where they specialize in nano uh, nanomaterials and technologies. And they're working on finding coatings um, to paint on the bottom of ships, like um, boats, um, marine, marine industry applications, also naval applications, uh, to stop algae and other microorganisms from collecting on the bottom of uh, ships and boats. And um, I, got I was introduced to all the graduate students, undergraduate students, the, uh, my mentor, and after that, I, I, it was around the time like SIP was ending, uh, early August, late June, I was able to land another internship uh, at a, locally, a local privately owned lab in Norwood called uh, ISA Inc. There they're working on um, antimicrobial -micro uh, coatings. Um, and I was, it was more hands-on experience and I think that was more beneficial for me. Uh, it was, I was paired with the lab assistant. However, she really allowed me to work independently and I gained a lot of like experience, uh, one, and then I was able to do a uh, literature search on 3D printing and gelatin, um, and like, hyd um, it was like hydrogen uh, printing. Um, I have a link for that as well. And um, I, I, I believe that with that internship, it really just like made me consider chemistry. I narrowed down to chem chemistry and bioengineering as possible career or majors. And my last internship is kind of more confidential as it was a clinical trial 
also a privately owned uh, lab in Norwood. It's called OGENEX. Um, due to HIPAA guidelines and bounds, I'm not able to share the specifics, but I will say <laughs> that um, one of the key like skills I've learned was in um, networking. Um, there's a platform, uh, it's called Web, uh, Webspace, or Rackspace, sorry. It's a webmail, um, which the whole team is using, and they kind of gave me separate links for the email uh, platforms for the data of the patients, and so on. And it was just like, it was a, it was a good experience. Um, unfortunately, I can't share it, but <laughs> it was very valuable. Um, it's an experience that I will remember, remember forever. And I would quickly like to thank Ms. Stewart and Ms. Davenport and everyone else who kind of allowed us to exper um, experiment this summer with our passions. And thank you, my SIP mates, for making it enjoyable. Thank you, committee, for taking the time to listen to our projects. Hi, I'm Megan McDonald, and my real passion is nature, so I decided to focus my SIP project on invasive species. As you can see from my mission statement, I really broke down my project into two, two parts, really. And one part was a public campaign, because invasive species is not a problem that people think about that often. So as a part of this, I worked to make an Instagram page to give people a sort of pocket guide they can take around with them that will have information on how to identify some invasive species, as well as what to do when you see one and the impacts that they can have. I also worked on making a series of most unwanted posters to kind of show around the town that showcase a series of invasive species that people might be able to find in their own backyard. And so the other aspect of my project was really working on doing in the field hands-on research. And that is where the help of my wonderful mentor, Miss Carol Frost, comes in. And she is a conservation biologist with the state. And she was fantastic. We were able to meet up once a week where she was able to teach me really critical knowledge about invasive species and how to identify them and the most effective removal techniques. And I was really able to learn a lot from her. And also with her, I was able to tag along with her on several days with her job where I got to work on an on a rare plant survey, as well as several invasive species removal projects, which was really wonderful to kind of experience the day in a life of a biologist and a botanist and stuff. And so it was really great to kind of get that hands-on research. And I was able to kind of combine those two aspects, the final part of my project, with a community walk at Hale, where I was able to lead members of the community around and show them real examples of invasive species as well as show them in our own community the impact that they can have. So thank you very much. So wait, I need to know what these invasive species are. <laughs> like give us an example. Well, the, probably the most problematic one at Hale would be glossy buckthorn, which once you, once you learn to see glossy buckthorn, I swear I see it everywhere. <laughs> and some of these invasive species can be really bad, like mile a minute can grow up to six inches a day. So that can really easily just overwhelm your whole yard, your whole garden, a whole forest like hail, which is why it's really important. Glossy what? Glossy buckthorn. <laughs> can you Google, Google that and send us a picture? Right. I'm going to write that down. down. I mean, yeah. if, you go, if you go at Invasive Species Westwood on Instagram, there's a whole guide to it. Doing that right now. That's wow. awesome. Wow. OK. Thank, Thank you. you. Good job. Consulting to gardeners locally. Right. Yeah. Exactly. How did it yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Cam Roberts, and over the past summer, I got the chance to be a part of the SIP program, and I got to the chance to explore my passion in engineering. And so I started off uh, by taking part in an Imperial College uh, London engineering course to get uh, some experience and understand what engineering actually was because we had I hadn't actually done any engineering before I just had like a general interest in it um, so this first two weeks of the SIP project I got to explore all the different fields of engineering 
and I uh, came away with three favorites. I really like biomedical engineering, uh, chemical engineering, and design engineering. And then this then helped me uh, search and narrow down my search for a mentor because I could find the specific fields that they were a part of. And so when I was contacting mentors, I was just looking for like biomedical engineers, chemical engineers, and design engineers nearby in Massachusetts. But this actually happened to be a big struggle of mine, and I about sent about like 25 to 30 emails, and a lot of them went unanswered, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so while I was waiting for a yes, I got to collaborate with a fellow uh, SIP member, Cy, and go with him to UMass Dartmouth to uh, explore uh, some chemical engineering and chemical synthesis of a chemical compound that uh, sea sponges excrete to keep biofilm off the bottom of boats. And I would say this uh, experience was very useful as it taught me about a, a lot of uh, lab procedures and a lot of ways to separate chemicals from one another. And so finally I got a yes, and it happened to be from one of my uh, sister's friend's dads who works at uh, Brown. His name is Dr. Wael Assad, and he's the associate professor of, professor of neuroscience at Brown University. And so over, this only happened in like the last two weeks of SIP, so I only got to go in a couple of times before. But I did cherish these last moments as I got to uh, observe a brain biopsy where they extracted a piece of brain tissue to examine if it was tumorous. And I also got to take part in observing some research that he was conducting on Alzheimer's and epilepsy. And so yeah, my biggest takeaway from this process is probably the networking, because all the no's and all the emails kind of taught me how to reach out to new people and strangers. And so yeah, thank you for your time. interesting that you talked about networking because a lot of you I think talked about networking mm -hmm. and this is such an important skill for once mm -hmm. you guys are in the working world and I just think this is great that you're all even though the experience can be frustrating it's your, <laughs> it's your learning you're learning that and I just think it's um I don't know I think it's great that you're all really experiencing that yeah. what, what happens in the real world so yeah it was really useful yeah, yeah. good job yeah. thanks <laughs> Um, hello, I am Sophia Zhao, and my passion is music. Um, I play the flute, and I just love sharing music and playing with others, and um, also encouraging other people to join, um, like get into music. So I thought for SIP it would be um, a great um, thing to organize a young musician's benefit concert to support the Westwood Public Schools Performing Arts Department and the Prodigy Program, um, both of which I am a part of. And so um, my mission was basically to uh, support these programs and also um, give students a platform to showcase their craft and also encourage students to um, kind of uh, get involved in music. So um, my mentor was Mr. Gerleo, who is who I know from Westwood Winds, um, and um, he was also he is also the former Westwood Public Schools uh, director of performing arts and the founder of the Prodigy program. And so, um, with his guidance, um, I had never organized anything like like this before. So, um, with his guidance, I was able to kick off the project, and so. The process of organizing over the summer involved um, recruiting musicians, so I reached out to uh, music te teachers in middle schools, high school, um, and also um, the Prodigy program. I also designed posters in the co concert program and um, uh, made a social media for the concert, and um, also had to determine venue and um, promote, of course, so I reached out to a bunch of local newspapers and um, also the uh, Westwood Public School social media. And I was um, really just like inspired by how warm everyone uh, was in, uh, I guess, like their willingness to help me kind of get the word out about the concert. And um, oh, and also uh, I had to like secure equipment and um, kind of plan and lead a rehearsal with all the performers. So the concert um, took place last Sunday, the 5th, at the Council of Aging Gazebo. 
and um, it was amazing. We had 19 performers, including myself, and from we had one performer from fourth grade uh, from Deerfield, and I think 17 from WHS, and even one alum. So it was um, everyone just blew everyone away, and um, the audience was so enthusiastic and supportive. And um, we ended up raising, I think, $805, which was crazy, but also <laughs> amazing. And um, so, yeah, something I'll definitely um, never forget from uh, the, this experience is how, I guess, the power of, the intrinsic power of music to kind of connect us and bring us together um, at any time and the willingness of just everyone to share and listen to music is very moving and um, uh, I was also very moved to hear uh, from uh, a few students um, that they hope that I like keep it going like they want to perform in future concerts and so yeah I was so inspired that you know passing it on is what it's all about uh, in music and sharing our ideas and yeah, <laughs> thank you. Great so how did you select, um, how did you select the charity or what, where does the $800 go? Oh yeah, so um, uh, they all are going to the WPS Performing Arts Department nice. and the Prodigy Program. So, nice. Yes. Great. Awesome. Great. Great job. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so our final student, um, Emily, could not be with us here this evening as the captain of the volleyball team. She felt the responsibility to her teammates to be there for their game. Um, however, she did pre-record um, her remarks. Do you mind coming up to the microphone? We can't really hear you. Oh, sorry. sorry. I'm not sure, I'm a little worried that our technology setup isn't going to allow okay. this, I'm told. I inquired beforehand. I can try. I'll, I'll click on the newspaper and see what happens. Okay. Oh, it might not be oh. the newspaper, although this would give us a link to her article. But oh. if we go back to the presentation and um, hit escape to exit presentation yes. mode okay. um, in the notes. because I gave you view only. One moment, please. <laughs> oh, I'm not shared it. Will we be able to hear it? I don't know if we're gonna be able to yeah. hear it. So okay. you know what? It's yet another link that I'm gonna send to okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. so that we can, okay. we can see it that way because it does look uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, so I would wonderful. Love to see that. So thank you. Can I just say, first of all, fantastic. Amazing. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, I do have a question. So this is the first time that we had done SIP in this summer format. And I'm just curious if you all have any feedback about whether or not you think that's the right way to do it. Should we be thinking about the way we had done it before? Is this an improvement, pros and cons? Because we need to make some choices, I think. So I'm curious what you think. Yes. Megan, Megan. <laughs> um, I think that it was really valuable to have it during the summer because I know that if it was during the school year, I'd probably definitely prioritize my in-school, like other classes over that. Mm. So I think I was willing to devote a lot more time and effort, and I think I'm a lot happier with the way my project turned out than I would have been if it happened during the school year. Okay. Can you give us a rough idea so you talk about time? Did all of you just do the SIP program for the summer? Did you have other jobs, some you had regular summer jobs? Like roughly, how many hours do you think a week you spend? spent on, uh, and it probably varies for, for you, but rough, rough estimate, 15, 20 hours, like a part-time job. Yeah. So Megan's saying summer. I'm curious, is that the consensus of the group, or are there people who have differing ideas about that? Mm -hmm. Sounds like a consensus. Exactly, yeah. mm -hmm. I think the summer is a great time to do it because you have a lot of free time. Yeah. But I wish we'd started like reaching out to people earlier a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's one like I got a couple of replies that were like, "Sorry, we've been full mm -hmm. since like April break and stuff." Mm -hmm. And so if we, I think if we started earlier, it would like kind of be perfect because you have a grip of what you wanted to do as the summer started, and yeah, it, yeah I would have enjoyed it more. Mm -hmm. if it was okay. that, That's interesting. So maybe you do the prep work during the school year 
and then launch in summer or something like that. Right. I wonder if it's hard too, the networking. I mean, some right. of you have said it's difficult. You had to make a lot of calls. It's because nobody works in the summer. Right. So <laughs> just let me in on the big secret out there. So um, it's hard to track, for those of us who do work in the summer, we know a lot that don't. But um, it's hard to track people down. So maybe to your point, right. you do some of that. Get your mentor early before the summer starts and uh, yeah. rein them in and then right, yeah. maybe right. for the future. Yeah. yeah. When I uh, first came on the school committee, I attended the the end of the year presentations, and families were brought in, and each student did like a half an hour. And I, I couldn't believe it. I did this, you know, how op what an opportunity it is for those of you that are innovators to try this, you know, and have some support and structure for you. Uh, I just want to point out to those of you that might be interested is, I think we're going to do another year here uh, of the Dale Carnegie course, which. Uh, if you're graduating from college, you're going to a major corporation, they put you through this. Uh, it's 24 hours of learning how to network, how to interview, how to do things like that. And Warren Buffett, who had an HBO series on him, started from nothing, the richest man in America, said he doesn't have his college degree on his wall. He, he has his, not his Columbia MBA, but he has his Dale Carnegie course. So. The only high school that I'm aware of in the United States that has ever offered this in the high school is Westwood High. And they take about 25 kids and we're hoping to do it again this year, but it's an opportunity before you go to college to learn about, it started out how to win friends and influence people, a book, but it, it's a terrific opportunity because I think you're all budding entrepreneurs. <laughs> you know, each one of you can take this experience and take advantage of college education you use it. But I just point that out. That's something, it's an opportunity that we're trying to bring back this year because of the COVID that I think a lot of you could really benefit a lot from learning his, the history of uh, what business people have taught each other and learned on, on, on how to succeed. And uh, just an, it's an alert because it should be coming out at some time when we lock it in. So I want to tell you this is definitely the best thing that I've experienced in like a year and a half. Okay. <laughs> so I want to thank you because I was sitting here listening to you thinking, and I don't know if anybody else here has this experience, that this is the reason I come to work. Yeah. And so it was a fantastic reminder of all these great things that you yeah. all are doing. Great job. I really uh, thank you. Uh, I'm worried that we've kept you here late and that you have homework, but I want you to sleep tonight. I mean that. So um, please make sure that at some time when you need to go to bed, if you haven't finished your work, send me an email if I need to email some teachers. Okay? Yeah. All right. You're getting a free pass. Which is free. <laughs> All right, and thank, thank you, you, Catherine. We yes. really appreciate yeah. it. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. thank you so much. All right. All right. Excellent. I know. You do not have to stay. <laughs> you suffered enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Oh, so awesome. You had a great job. Yeah. Great job. And that's what it's all about. I know. I know. It's amazing. You're right. The best thing oh, yeah. in the past year and a half that we've heard. The musical was great, too. I, I, yeah. I, that was fantastic. Yeah. There's a lot of good things. Yeah. Okay. That is a point of order, so it's kind of getting late. What's the? I know we have a lot. I love the pre-reads. Are there input you need on the following items, or yeah? No. So actually, we feel confident that we could table the ESY yep. okay. um, thing. Yeah. And um, the um, the first read of the concussion policy. I mean, it's a periodic review. I don't think that's okay. urgent, so we could certainly. No, I mean, I saw. Yeah, I didn't know if there was anything. It looked like it was housekeeping and some stuff. It looks like yeah. Yeah, so uh, do you want me to move to that? To the yeah, why don't we? Okay, so the concussion policy. Yeah, I mean, basically our athletic trainer, Paul Lilla, um, has provided you a revision. So we do look at this yeah. uh, every two years. And um, he gave you the, 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 the markup so mm -hmm. you can see what's changed. And it really is sort of just a different program that we're using to do some of the 
um, the testing yeah. work. And, yeah. and I, I did want to comment, um, you know, a member of the public commented, and she had also sent me an email, and I, I do just want to underscore that um, I think that we take very seriously the concussion protocols, and it doesn't just pertain to students who are in athletics. Mm -hmm. So students who experience a concussion, certainly they would get academic accommodations and, you know, and all of, um, all yeah. of those supports. Okay, um, we've tabled the ESY, right? Yep. So, the status of DESI mask mandate and the district face covering policy. Yeah. I'm not sure there's too much to talk about. Well, there really isn't. I mean, so you all have read um, what, what came out right after DESI put the mandate in place, and um, we are anticipating that we will be hearing something from DESI, I hope, soon, but I have to be honest, I suspect it probably will be like the last week of September. Um, you know, I, um, so I don't know. The mandate is in place. The language says until at least October 1. And so I think we're really kind of waiting to find out what happens and they have indicated that they will be providing some metrics for us to look at, so. And under the current guidance, if it's by building, Mm -hmm. Naturally, Thurston, the middle school, could never get there until sixth graders could be back. Yeah. Basically, almost impossible. So, almost impossible. <laughs> I did the math. Not, okay. um, and I mean, it would be a squeaker. Yeah. Um, I have to say, boosted by the very high staff yeah. vaccination rates, right? If we count them yeah. and the population of the school. Um, yes, because sixth graders aren't eligible. I mean, it would have to be pretty much every yeah, seventh and eighth grader to get to that, that standard. But we saw we, you know, 12 to yeah. 15 well, is. And as they get older. Yeah. yeah. So that's As they move through the yeah, school that's year. True. They get older. Yeah. yeah. So we'll wait. So it's a wait and see what Desi says. Um, and we can go from there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think that's it for discussion items. We are moving on to action items. And we have one, which is the approval of the August 17th, 2021 meeting minutes. <coughs> Motion to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion is carried. That went fast. Faster without the roll. Oh, that went <laughs> so fast. Okay, is there any new business? I just wanted to share Oh, yes. Uh, Charlie yeah. wanted to share something. This is more good news. This, good is, news. this is for people to oh, take sorry. home. Uh, I get a lot of calls uh, from this report every year. Uh, it's uh, the Boston uh, Magazine hires a, uh, a gentleman who rates schools school systems and this is the high school rating edition this is this month and Westwood was ranked 14th out of all of the high schools uh, in Eastern Massachusetts within 495 uh, we're better supposedly than some very distinguished schools like Boston Latin Wellesley Concord uh, Brookline and Newton uh, the back page for you to look at later is just where we rank relative to all of these other places uh, and uh, the uh, uh, MCAs, uh, English, we're 11th out of the top 20. Uh, math, we're fifth. Science and technology, sixth. And then these are the average SAT scores, the uh, advanced placement per percent proficient. Uh, and it's just something for us to talk about sometimes if anybody has an interest. Uh, I'm just, what are we doing so well in math and science that we're one of the the top five or six in the state. That's uh, uh, it's always so as we look at our you know our scores and all of that we can look at it. But it's, it's I get calls from people both congratulating the administration and the school system, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're very happy to be here. And uh, and the Joe Zephyr and the previous school committees over the years have had an impact. But I just thought uh, it'd be worth everybody looking at, and uh, in case you start getting telephone calls yourselves. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Great. Thank you for sharing, Charlie. Okay, um, I think that's it. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Oh. Um, there was a second before the motion, but we'll take it. All right, you, you made the motion. Tony gave a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for coming in person. We appreciate it, as always. We appreciate Western Media Center setting up this we very elaborate system. Back yeah. Yeah. Awesome. No, Yay to Western Media you Center. Shower. Literally throw it in your fire. And thank you. If you don't do anything, I'm going to eat my dinner right now. <laughs> I'm starving. I'm staring at the food. No, really.